the, the reason the reason I don't I didn't tell you about the buttons and pressing them is because no one ever presses the button when I do tell them about it. All right, no one ever does. Yeah, because yeah, it, it zooms in on you. So, so that's the reason I, I have not said anything. Uh, I don't think any, like I said, I don't think anyone has ever uh, pressed it on purpose. But you are welcome to now that we know about it. All right. Uh, all right, um, you know, and you never know who's in the class, witness protection program, you know, whatever. So, you know, this goes out on YouTube, so, you know, you might not necessarily want uh, to know this. All right, the one thing that we should know by now is that we've looked largely at text on our pages. So, um, we're going to continue that theme, and we're going to go over, I forgot my book today, but one of the chapters that relates to formatting text. I'm not sure what chapter that is. Maybe chapter three? Chapter four? Yeah. It is kind of a boring chapter. So I am not going to go over everything in it. All right? You know it's bad when an instructor says that it's boring because we typically have no problem with stuff that's boring, right? So, but if I say, well, gee, this is boring, I don't want to go, then, you know, it must be. But anyhow, it's, it's important. And, and, and here's the point of it. Let me try to summarize the whole point of it. And then we'll skip on and, and we'll go into more exciting things. All right. We'll go over a few examples, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go over some, um, we'll go over the, the, the main idea here. And the main idea is that you should, as specifically as you can, define what each bit on your page means. All right. So, for example, that, that, that's why we use the H1s, H2s, and so on, because it's not just text, it's a heading. A heading is different than regular text, all right? A heading, you know, indicates the meaning of a section or the, 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 the main idea of the page or, or whatever it means, you know. So we use the H2 tags for that. An article, well... We separate our pages into articles and, and the different other things that we talked about last time because, again, that, that gives a very good description of what that means. All right, this is an article. This is a second article. All right, we've told the browser exactly what it means. That's important for two reasons. Number one, um, if you're very clear about what the text means, then any software that reads it has a better chance of interpreting it and maybe figuring certain things out about it. For example, um, people that are blind access web pages through what's called a screen reader. And we'll probably look at an example of this uh, later on, where actually the text of the screen is read to the person. All right. Now, for someone like that, accessing through a special piece of software, it helps to give the software some tips about what that text actually means instead of just a bunch of undifferentiated text. All right, that this is the navigation section, and this is an aside, and this is an article. That, that it, it, at the very least, it gives the potential for those sorts of applications to do a better job handling it, as well as for the browser. So it helps to define things specifically in there because that will help any software that accesses that web page whether it be search engines or screen readers or browsers or, or mobile browsers. It will help all those pieces of software um, be able to interpret the page better. The other reason we do it is we do it for styling purposes. All right? One thing that we, we, we've, ta you know, we've seen just a little example of styles on a web page, one sort of fundamental rule of uh, style when you're designing a web page is things that are alike, you know, or comparable, should look the same. So, for example, if we have two articles, all right, and they're, you know, the same important, you know, um, it's not like one of them's a sub-article of the other one, they're two separate articles, we want them to look the same. So if we make a light gray background, with a black border on one, we should make a light gray background with a black border on the other. That gives the user a, a visual hint right off the bat that these two are the same thing. 
all right? As opposed to if you have an article, and then maybe you have a sidebar for that article, you know, um, article about the Super Bowl that says everything that happened in it, little, or actually I got that backwards, an article about Beyonce's performance that says everything about that, and then a little sidebar about the Super Bowl game itself, right? <laughs> All right. If you format those differently, that sets the expectation in the user's mind, hey, that there's something different about these. That, that, and they may not know necessarily at a glance what the difference is, but that gives a tip that there's something different about these two things, that one of them is just sort of a sidebar about the other ones, that they're not equally uh, important articles. So that's sort of a fundamental rule. And if we're very good about declaring things for what they really are, we can make sure that happens consistently. Yes? Okay. Uh, the question was, is at the end of chapter three, they talk about name and they talk about class. And we did talk briefly about ID uh, we uh, when in terms of making internal links on the page. ID and class will come, will become very important when we get deeper into CSS. All right. With the class and with, with ID attributes, we can define a certain look, not for everything on the page, or not even for every H1 or every link or whatever on the page, but for certain ones. So the ID in class will become very important when we start talking about styling. Uh, it won't be the same ID because an, an ID has to be unique. All right, so an ID, if you have something on a page called main, all right, there can only be one thing on a page called main, all right. You can have things have the same class. So if you have a class of important, you can have two things that are important. Class has. Um, the question is, 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 um, is how would we use the class and the ID and the name? So, so let's rewind and let me try to answer this question completely. The class and the ID will become more important as we get into CSS. There's really no need to worry about them now if you don't want to. Uh, the name is something, and they, they, make, uh, they, they do some discussion on the name, and they also talk about the role, if I'm not mistaken, uh, somewhere in the book. And that has importance as far as accessibility, but um, read it, note it, that isn't necessarily something you need to worry about now. The role will become actually very important if you uh, design web pages especially for uh, mobile devices. Because there's a, a neat little tool set called uh, jQuery Mobile that uses the role to help decide how to format things on a mobile device. So the bottom line is, is class, name, ID, role. Note them, know what they mean, but really you don't have to worry about them. And the ones that we're going to come back to and really hit heavily are class and ID. So that would be my answer. All right. So we talked about formatting text. And, and is it, it, everything is better off if you identify your text as accurately as possible. And in chapter whatever it is, chapter four, there is a slew of different formatting things depending on what your text is. For example, if you're showing a time, all right? And again, I forgot my book, so I'll have to do some Googling here. No, that's okay. I actually like to show that I don't have this memorized, all right? I think it's of comfort. I think sometimes people think that, that professors like know everything. Maybe not, I don't know. Uh, maybe some people do. Um, and, and 
I guess my point is, is that for some things, it's, it's enough to know that there is such a thing, and I will go out and get the details if I need it. So, for example, I know there's a tag to format time. I think it's called time. Let me go out and run and, and, and do a quick Google search to see what it means. All right, so I find this page and blah, 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 blah. All right, and I'll copy this example in to my second page. I'll put a paragraph here. This page was altered on February 5th, 2013. What I can do is I can put the time tag on that to indicate that that's the time. Date and time meaning roughly the same thing. You know, if you think about it, a time, a, a date is just like a very unspecific time, right? I mean, it describes a 24-hour period as opposed to if I were to say it is 1114, there really is only 1114 for an instant, right? And, you know, it, it's that for a, a full minute, 1114. So uh, the time of February 5th, 2013, it's that for um, the day. So I can then go in and say, and put the date time attribute. All this is doing all the date time attribute does along with the time is it gives the time in a consistently formatted fashion. All right? For example, if you think about it, how many ways are there to format the date? There's millions of them, right? I could type in 2013. All right. That's another way I could express that date. Well, by putting it in a time tag and by using this date time attribute, we can consistently format to say, yeah, you know, all that flowery language, what they mean is 2013, February 5th. All right. So that's one thing. The visibility to the user, it's not going to look any different. All right. But I could, through CSS, do something to make that time tag bold. So all of my time tags might look a certain way. Yes? Let me see. Well, remember, the time tag has an additional attribute to it. So, yeah. So I could, and one thing I'm going to do to make this chapter a little more interesting is I'm going to play around with CSS too. See, there's no boring topics. There's only boring professors. Remember that. So, the reason I'm doing this is to show that, hey, I can designate all my times to look a certain way. So wherever I have something defined as a time, it will have a certain look. And in this case, I'm doing it in red. I could make it bold. I could make it a different font and so on. Also, screen readers will uh, identify this as a time and, and be able to do that. Yes? Uh -huh. As red, correct. 
Now, hopefully you're not lying to your browser and putting in, in a date, in a time tag, you know, Fred, you know, but, you know, the CSS would work that way. So there, and I'm hoping no one is colorblind, all right, but we'll see that as red. One thing we'll learn later on in this class is if you do something with color to like show some sort of special meaning, like here, red equals, um, red equals a time, you'll do something else in it to make it uh, apparent. So that way if you're colorblind, you might not notice the color, like if you had red-green colorblindness, that might not be apparent that that's in red. So what you'll do is you'll do something like you'll put a different attribute on here. For example, I could make the font bigger. Hundred ten percent, let's say. That's a little bigger than normal. And what that will do is, whoops. That'll make it a little bigger than normal. So if you can imagine, if you were colorblind, let's say, and that red just kind of looks like a dark gray, it might be indistinguishable from the black text around it. However, we can see that that's a little bit bigger. So you'd at least get that visual cue, the fact that the font is bigger. Someone that can see colors, well, they'll see it red and they'll see it bigger. So they get both visual cues. All right. We'll talk more about website accessibility later on, but now would be a good time uh, to uh, at least mention it. Another very useful um, tag is the block quote tag. And the block quote is meant to be when you have a long quote, you know. Like, imagine if you're writing a term paper, all right. If I were to say, the teacher said, oh, now let's do a better one. If I were to say it was, the best of times, it was the worst of times, a quote from Tale of Two Cities, that's just essentially a sentence. I would just show that inside my paragraph and say, Dickens was referring to, and so on. If, however, I have a bigger quote, if I quote, say, a whole paragraph or several sentences, I'll do what's called a block quote. And it might look something like this. And this is, this is the same thing that you do in a term paper as you do on a web page. I might have my paragraph, then I'd set aside the quote like this, and then I'd have another paragraph. So let's look at, let me, let me go and grab some text. Let's look at the Declaration of Independence. Why not? I could say something like this. Start a paragraph and say, the Declaration of Independence begins this way. Then I could put in a block quote tag. Okay. I could put a block quote tag in and put the quote between the block quote like that. All right. Now if I view the web page, notice that that quote gets indented because I've defined it as a block quote. I could then continue on with the paragraph, say something like 
end my paragraph. This was written by Thomas Jefferson in 1776 and so on. So, if we look at that, we can see, we get the visual cue that that is a block quote. That's what you do on a term paper, right? If you're quoting an extensive section. If you're just quoting a few words, you could just put that anywhere in the paragraph. But if you're quoting several sentences, you'd use a block quote. So that's what the block quote tag is for. So if you're quoting something, you would put it in a block quote tag. And again, that gives the user a visual cue by default. You see that's indented. You know that there's something different about that. All right, that's not, it's not just another part of the paragraph. But then we could do things with the style of that if we wanted to. Let's go in and change the style of this. And I could make the block quote have a background of gray. And that's how it looks. We can do other things with it as well. We can make the font bigger, whatever. Remember, just about anything we can do about, we can, we can, we can describe about appearance, we can change the CSS for. So I could also make the font size of that bigger. Let's make the quotes really big, 120%. And let's make the text color white. All right. So now we have our block quote and it's formatted differently. No. No, it doesn't matter which order the attributes are in the style tag. So let's go back and review this. I know we're jumping a little ahead with CSS. All right, it's helping us get through this, this boring topic. All right. Um, notice again, the block quote, it's indented. All right, let's see, let's notice the different things about the block quote. It's indented, it has a gray background, it has white letters, and the letters are bigger than normal. All right. So how do we get it to look that way? Through our style rule. Again, in our style tag, we say block quote. That means that every block quote on the page will look this way. Every block quote on the page will look this way. And you know, a lot of times that's exactly what you want, right? Why? Because of the basic design rule that I said, like things should look the same, like things should look similar. So later on, I quoted the Declaration of Independence again. Let's quote the whole paragraph. All right. It ends this way. I can put that within a block quote tag. Because again, it's more than a couple line quote, or more than like a one line quote. And we look at this, and we'll see we have our second block quote. You could take your glasses off if you wear glasses, or you could squint your eyes, or you could go way out in the, whatever that building's called over there, the eye loft. And assuming that, the, that I arranged this so you could see through the window, 
You might not have any idea what it says, but you know that this is the same kind of thing as this. Right? Why? Because it looks the same. It's reasonable to assume. People make those, you know, your brain's a wonderful thing. Your brain comes to all these conclusions, all right, without you even thinking about it. And that's one of the things that good design does, is it gives the, the reader some visual cues as to what that document, how that document is structured. So, I go down and look, I get the idea, oh, he's quoting the Declaration of Independence here. I see this without even thinking about it. I know that he's, again, quoting the Declaration of Independence. How did we do that? Again, with the style rule. The fact that I have block quote, that's the selector. That defines who on this page gets the style rule. So not every paragraph gets this. Not every part of the paragraph gets this. And the headers don't get it. And the links don't get it. But the block quote gets it. What about the block quote? Well, I want the color of the text white. I want the background to be gray. And I want the font size to be 120% of what it normally is. So these are three style rules for block quotes. Again, each style rule consists of an attribute from a predefined list of attributes of which there are a lot of, not just a couple, there's a whole bunch of them, like anything you could think of. You want to put a border around it. You want to put a background image to it. You want uh, almost any, any visual attribute that you could think of we can control. But they're done in pairs. Name of attribute, colon, value for attribute, semicolon. Then the next, name of attrib attribute, colon, value of attribute, semicolon, and so on. And notice that it's just the block quotes that get this because that's the selector. That's what I put at the beginning, block quote. So block quotes get this. Now, if you're observant, you might notice that I didn't say anything about the indenting of this. All right? My style rule, I don't say how much it's going to be indented. I just say the background color, the color of the text, and the font size. And yet, if I look at this, it's indented. How does it get to be indented? Well, that's a default behavior of the browser. All right? Remember, your page, the way your page looks has uh, two components. Your page get it, gets its looks from two different places. One of them is the default behavior of the browser, and the other is through your CSS code. So, I didn't say anything about the indenting or the margins or anything. Therefore, the browser's default takes over and indents it a little bit. All right? Um, I did say something about the background color and the text color and the text size, so that takes precedence. Questions? Yes? If you wanted it, the first block quote to be like that and then the second one, mm -hmm. can you do that? Yes, you can. The question is, is what if I don't want block quotes to look identical? What if, for example, later on I wasn't quoting the Declaration of Independence, but I was quoting another book? And I wanted to say, okay, you know, um, this is really different than, than that. Uh, they're both quotes, but maybe I'll show a different color for this one, for example. All right. Um, I'm going to show you how you do it. If you don't catch this, don't worry about it. But this is where class and IDs come in. So I could do something like this. You can define style rules for HTML tags. You can also define style rules as having a class. Mike Zeller said, The Declaration 
of independence is really cool. I especially dig that crazy John Hancock's signature. All right. Now, that's a block quote, right? You quoted me. And it looks the same. Somehow when I think about it, though, my quote doesn't quite seem as important as the actual text of the Declaration of Independence, right? So, yeah, it's a quote, all right? So you could make the argument, it's a quote, it should look the same. But for me, it somehow doesn't seem as important, all right? So what could I do? I could make a style rule. If I change the, the style rule for block quote, it's going to change all of them. I could make a style rule for instructor quotes. Now, there's no instructor quote tag, right? So I can't just type in as a selector instructor quote. What I can do is I can start it with a period, though. And maybe what I'll do is I'll make the color of those yellow. And I'll make the font smaller. Because obviously what I have to say is less important than what Thomas Jefferson has to say. Oops. Now. So I've defined a style rule for a class here. The period at the beginning means it's a class. Now, the question is, is how does the browser know which is a regular quote and which is an instructor quote? Well, I have to tell it. How do I tell it? I tell it via the class attribute. So to your question before, what I can do is on any of those quotes that aren't real quotes from the declaration but are instructor quotes, I could put in a class equals instructor quote. Oops. And now if we look at it, you'll notice that those quotes look the same. This quote looks a little different. All right. We're still following good design practices, right? We've just refined it. Instead of having every quote look the same, we're having every quote from the Declaration of Independence look the same, every quote from another source look a little different. All right? Now, one thing you might notice, in my style rule, I didn't define the background color for it. Yet, the background color of it is gray. That's the cascading part. If we look at these style rules, what this is saying is every block quote has this style. Those items which have a class of instructor quote has this style. If something is both a block quote and has a class of instructor quote, it will get some of the attributes from both. So because the class is more specific than tag, that takes precedence. But if I haven't defined something for a particular class, then what I've defined on the HTML tag will be in effect. That's the whole cascading part of it. So to answer your question, you can do it via classes and IDs. By classes, you can put several things in that all have the same class. With IDs, the idea is about the same, except IDs are unique. And IDs don't start with a period. They start with a pound sign. All right. If you didn't get that bit about classes, don't worry about it. Just know the basic parts. But some folks, you know, especially folks that are having an easy time with this, I think it's good to, to present this material uh, at this point. Yeah, the style, the style should be... Um, for now, the styles will be in a style tag that's part of the head section. Later on, we're going to move though that style information into a separate file. 
all right? And the idea of moving it in a separate file is that we can share the same style for many web pages, all right? So in other words, instead of having the style embedded in every HTML page, we'll have the style linked. We'll have the HTML pages linked to a style file, and therefore if I change the one style file, it changes everyone, all right? I'm not ready to do that today. It's actually pretty easy, but I don't want to deviate too far from the point. No, you do not have to put the class on the end tag. All right? The class, in fact, any HTML attribute only belongs on the start tag. It doesn't belong on an end tag. So, for example, time, where I define that, hey, Whatever this text is, it represents this date and time. Um, I don't put that on the end time tag or link. A href equals, I don't put that on the end tag. So no, the attributes only belong on the start tag. Good question. Uh-huh. No, I would need to change that as well. Yeah, I'd have to change that as well. But then, I could make a smart enough browser that if it notices a date time, if I click something, it might open my calendar for that day, for example. All right? So again, the, the browser could, could do it. But yeah, it's not like it reads that text and figures it out. The whole point of having that attribute is I can put it any way I want to as a date. I could put it that, that this was changed the day after tomorrow, all right? And as long as I put the, what the actual date is in that date attribute, that's, you know, um, then that explains it. Now, associated with the block tag element is the site, uh, or the block quote element is a site attribute. So, if I'm quoting, if I have a web page that I got it from, for example, in this case, I pulled the um, text of the Declaration of Independence from the, the National Archive. What I could do is this. I should be able to just put the site attribute, but because the way the browser does not really do anything with it, I would need to create a link. So that's kind of useless, the site attribute. 
but it is available as an attribute in the block tag, block quote tag. But they suggest here to, to use something else as well. So I could then go and click on that and take them to the page of where we got the information from. All right. So there's a whole bunch of other text formatting tags. All right. There is for address, which can relate to either like a physical address um, or, uh, or, or, you know, or, or, or I'm sorry, will relate to like the, the email address of, a, um, of the author. There is emphasis that you can put on, and you can do that via either the M or strong. An M means that I want to emphasize a word. Strong means I want to strongly emphasize it. So notice when I put that in the M tag, by default, it made it in italics. Now you can change that if you want by putting the text in an M tag, EM, it put that text in italics. I could also do strong if I wanted to, strongly emphasize it, and then it will make it bold. However, through our CSS, we can change that to be anything we wanted. We could emphasize things by making it green text, for example, or whatever. That's just the default. There's a tag for abbreviations. There's a tag for definitions. You know, abbreviations are a good one. Let's look at that real quick. So notice what I did, ABBR, title equals, I put the full meaning of the abbreviation. Then within the abbreviation tag, I specify USA. So I define the abbreviation. So now if we view this page, notice if I put my mouse on it, I get a little tooltip. All right. Now, how would the user even know that you could put the mouse on it? They wouldn't, all right? unless we make it look different, all right? If we make it look different, that's a tip off to the user, hey, this text is different. So maybe if I put my, maybe it's a link, maybe if I put my mouse over it, I'll see. So again, this is where style provides a visual cue to the user that, hey, there's something different about this. USA is not just the three letters USA, it's an abbreviation for something. So I could say, you know, color um, red. So now it's red. That sort of gives the user a tip. Hey, if you put your mouse on it, something might happen. All right. The nice thing about this is it's very unobtrusive, right? In other words, you know, we, I, you know, I would assume everyone would know what USA meant in this context. Or if I was doing a web page about HTML, I would assume most web designers would know what HTML meant or, or what CSS meant. But you're always liable to run into someone, a novice or whatever, that doesn't understand your abbreviations. You know, This allows you in a very unobtrusive way to put in the meaning of the abbreviation. And then if the user just hovers their mouse over it, it shows uh, the full meaning of it. All right? You know. Sometimes, especially in IT, the abbreviations drive you crazy, and I can't remember all of them. Yeah, there you go, right? And so to be able to do this on a page, it can be very beneficial, all right? 
There's a similar sort of thing for definition. It gave me the it gave me the definition of tag. Wow. I'll just copy this as is. I am sure the founding fathers enjoyed hot beverages. Paste that code in there. The DL stands for um, definition list. Following the definition list, you have pairs of DTs and DDs. DT is a definition term. DD is the definition itself. So, we go and look at this. It just formats that differently. And it shows a list with the definition underneath it. Style you could, yeah, exactly. You could, yeah, you could, there's a lot of things that you could do with that. You actually, I mean, and this is where, you know, this is where folks like me start getting like really like happy and excited because you could do really cool stuff. For example, you could make the definitions invisible and make them appear when the user puts their mouse over over it. All right. Why? Well, what does that require? That requires knowing the CSS to make it invisible, knowing the CSS to make it visible and then being able to write the JavaScript that can toggle it between visible and invisible. All right? So the idea here is, is that these technologies work in conjunction. All right? We haven't talked about JavaScript yet in this class. We have talked about HTML, which is a content. In other words, we have a list of definitions in there, or a list of terms in their definition. We have CSS that says, how are we going to display those terms and definitions? And then we have JavaScript about how we can change things on the fly, how we can make the page interactive. All right. Um, read through that chapter. Um, there, are, there are things like subscripts and superscripts, like if you're doing uh, uh, chemistry formulas, H2O, all right, or if you're doing math expressions, x squared plus y squared equals b squared or whatever, um, and so on. There's, there's uh, strike throughs and inserts. For example, like if you're doing policies for an organization, if um, let's say there was a policy that applied to full and part-time employees, but then they changed it and they got rid of part-time employees, you could put a strike through so that you could see, hey, it used to apply to, to part-time employees, it does not anymore. All right? Um, so read through the formatting of text. All right. Um, not covering everything. Again, that's why you have the book to go through and read uh, and understand it. I do want to make clear the bigger point, though, that you want to be as specific as possible when you format your HTML code to really describe what each piece of text means. And again, you do that because that gives software the potential to be able to do a better job handling it. All right. In addition, it gives you options as far as styling the page better. As we said, like making all definitions look the same or making all block quotes look the same or whatever. Next time we will start on images. All right? And and we'll really start to have fun there. Yes.
Y you have to guess. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you will get a you you. You will get an you will get an email like okay the question is how do I how do how does a student know that that I've gotten their their uh, their, their assignments when you upload it if it looks like it worked and it doesn't give you any errors it probably did all right what I would do is generally speaking within a week of when the assignment was originally due I aim to have it graded so the first assignment was due last Thursday so by this Thursday I should have it graded alright if it turns out to be this Thursday and you don't get an email from me saying I've graded it and this is your grade then you might want to send me an email saying are you behind or on occasion if I'm behind grading I'll post a notice saying look I'm, I'm behind grading but my goal is to have everything wrapped up within a week of the original due date now sometimes for people that like work quick it can actually seem like a really long time, all right? Because, like, let's say you turned it in the first day that you got the assignment. You may actually be waiting a couple weeks. Um, if you are not sure and you are anxious to get a grade or, or you are anxious to know if you did it correctly, your best bet then is to, in addition to uploading it to the Dropbox, send me an email and say, you know, I turned it in. I think it's right, but could you take a look and, and tell me, all right? So... Feel free to do that as well. Other questions? All right, see you over in Lamb.